as a deputy, a messenger, specifically of God, that is an angel, also a prophet, priest or teacher, an ambassador, angel, king or messenger. That's a very broad term for the word angel. You know, we always think of angel meaning a heavenly being. Actually, it has more. There's something interesting. Can a person or people be an angel? Yes. Revelation 3, 14, 15. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Yes, people can be angels. Why? They all can be messengers. An angel is just a different word for messenger. What about, can God be an angel? Yes. And Jacob, uh, Genesis 32, 24 and 30. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And Jacob called the man the name of the place Peniel, because I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. He wrestled with the man. Later Genesis, he told him what it was. The angel which redeemed me from evil. With whom did he wrestle? With God or with an angel? Who is the Redeemer? Isaiah 40, uh, 54 verse 5 For your maker is your husband. I am of hosts. Just a reminder, I usually say I am because it's much more personal. <coughs> it just come from Exodus. So I speak up to the people of Israel. I am. They have sent me to you. So it's just to remind, it's for me where I see him as eternal. Okay? The, his name is your name, Bafkei. Um, but I just use I am for me personally. Um, I am of hosts is his name. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. There's only one Redeemer. God. So who is this angel? God. Another one. Joshua 5, 13 to 40. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn out in his hand. And Joshua went to him and asked, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he replied, No, but as captain of the host of I am, I have come. And Joshua fell down to his face and worshipped, saying, What do you want to say to your servant? To whom may you worship? Did the angel rebuke him? No. But what happens if you worship a normal angel? And I fell down at his feet in Revelation 19. I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do it, because I am your fellow servant and of your brothers that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That was God speaking to Joshua as an angel. So the word angel is just messenger. Next. But then what are these beings if they are human nor God? Hebrews. Now, I'm going to quote the entire Hebrews 1. It's a little bit long, but uh, here's the best description of what these beings are. God, who at sundry times in diverse ways spoke in times past to the fathers by prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, who He has appointed heir of all things, by whom He has made the worlds, who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. Note. Being made so much better than angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He's not speaking about man. Angels. So there's another type of being other than man and God that we know of. Because to which of the angels did he say at any time, you are my son, and this day I have begotten you. Or, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Or, when he brought in the first begotten into the world, he said, And let all the angels of God worship him. Angels, normal angels, do not receive worship. 
And of the angels, he said, who makes his angels spirits? There's a clue. And these beings are spirits. And he's ministers of flame. So these beings are ministers. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. That is why God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above others. You, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are all the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wax old as a garment, and as a vesture will you fold them up. And they will be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not fail. But to which of the angels did he say at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who will be heirs of salvation? Did you catch that? Angels, the, the anti Messiah spirit, is a spirit, not a human, not God, nothing. There's a different entity, and we're going to go into that now. But first, so we ask an angel can be God, a person of people, or a spirit. Spirit. So then, what are demons? Revelation 12, 7. And there was war in heaven. I just, you know, that, that part is just so contradictory to itself. War in heaven. <laughs> uh, have you ever thought about that? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but there was war in heaven. War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. I'm not going to go into depth with Michael, I'm just talking about the anti spirit. We can have a discussion with that in the future. But the dragon and his angels did not prevail, nor was there any place found anywhere in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. I call Satan the adversary. Again, makes sense for me. Which, which is the meaning of Satan which deceived the whole world, he was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. What do we have here on this, on this planet? Spirits that war against God. Okay. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but one thing I want to mention. Spirits can manifest themselves as humans. Though Satan has fallen, though the adversary has fallen, he's still, he's still an angel, he's still a spirit. He can manifest himself into a human. Yeah, it also talks about the angel of, an angel of light. Exactly, yes, yes, he can manifest himself. That is an answer. But I'm not going to go into that too much detail, dealing with the spirit. Okay. Are you being naughty again? Ah. Okay, God is on trial. So, the first thing that we see in a court case, we see a judge, we see, uh, or we see the jury, a judge, perhaps a lawyer or an accuser, and the defendant. Now, what do I mean by God is on trial? God is that guy sitting there being accused of something. Does that make sense? You know? So, let's look into this. So, here I ask the question, war in heaven? What was this war about? Now, scripture doesn't explicitly always give us information about what happened. But it does draw the veil back and gives little glimpses here and there. So, I cannot definitively tell you in full detail what was going on. But we can see some traces and we can follow it up from there. So, we start with Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God, I'm not going to, again, not going to go into sons of God, just talking about the topic at hand, came to present themselves before I am, and the adversary came as well. And I am asked the adversary, where do you come from? And, he, and then he answered, 
from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And I am asked the adversary, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and turns from evil? Now what a weird conversation. So, suppose you come to me and you say, uh, I ask you, where do you come from? No, I come from Benoni. Have you seen this guy? There's an underlying context of what this conversation is about. May I imply that the adversary went to God to say, I've got victory. And God says, no you haven't, have you considered my my servant Job. And look at the description he gives Job. That there is none like him in the earth. Perfect! How many Christians say it's, that's impossible? Yeah, God says, perfect and upright man. One that fears God. Fearing God means he keeps the commandments. See, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And turns from evil. Satan says this is not so. So what did Satan reply then the adversary replied, Does God, Job fear God for nothing? Didn't you make a hedge about him? His, uh, 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 about him, his, about, why, why did I write that? And all that he has on every side, you blessed the works of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forward your hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. In other words, Talk nonsense, my God. Mm. He's only serving you for selfishness. Mm -hmm. I'll get to back later. But do you see the spirit that comes into you? There's an accusation going on. The adversary is putting God on trial. Mm -hmm. Who's the jury? Sons of God? Other angels. There's a jury going on. God is being on trial and he has an accuser. And the accuser is saying, this and this and this. So we're going to go into these accusations and this will become much more interesting. Job 1, 11, 22. Note what Job has done. And I am replied to the adversary, look all that he has in your power, except for himself. So, I am says, okay, I'm being put on trial here. Let's see, let's, let's put it to the test. Now, Job doesn't know what's going on. You know, this is the interesting thing. Bad stuff happens to us, but we don't know what's the bigger picture of what's going on. Job has no clue. So, what happened at the end? In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God foolishly. What did he do without knowing it? He vindicated God. That is what this war is about. God's vindication against the adversary's accusations. Okay? The adversary's accusation number one. As we saw in Job, your law is unjust, as it is impossible to be kept. Therefore, you are unjust for giving an unjust law. Satan says, your law cannot be kept. That's why he went to heaven. That's why he went into the council and said, I've walked up and down the earth. And God says, really? Look at this guy. My law can be kept. Job was perfect. Now the word perfect has diverse meanings. They can mean absolute perfect or it can mean presently perfect. What is absolute perfect? There's only one being God. That's absolute perfect. But present perfect, you're doing everything that is required. The guy that died on the cross next to Christ was perfect. Okay? For at that point. If he turned back to evil, not perfect. But when you turn towards God, you become perfect. And you live that life. He was perfect because he turned from evil and lived and feared God. 
He did that which was right. Righteousness. So that's the first accusation. There's another accusation. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil about his dispute over the body of Moses, dared not bring up against him a railing accusation, but say, I am rebukes you. What an interesting verse is in this. What happened here? So, Michael went to go get the body of Moses, and there was adversary. Mm -hmm. And the adversary makes his accusation. Now, what would the, be the accusation be? Well, the scripture says, what happens when you die? In sin. Did Moses die before or after Christ? Obviously, before. So, what's the second accusation here? You cannot be 100% merciful and excuse to resurrect Moses, a sinner, while claiming to be 100% just. Let me put it to you this way. Any court that is excusing someone without paying the penalty by being trying to be merciful is not just. You cannot be 100% just while at the same time 100% merciful. Now that's the second accusation. And this accusation also would also imply if you're going to excuse these sinners, you can excuse us. God's government is without sin, right? Are you unjust? And brings us back to the first accusation. You are unjust. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 36 says another accusation. And this is the third and final one. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 25. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, So declares Lord I am. I do not do this for your sakes. Hang on. What he's going to say here is not doing it for, for Israel. He's doing it for him. There's an accusation coming up. His name is be, he's, he's being accused of something, so he's clearing this accusation. O oh, house of Israel, but for my name, holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, you haven't vindicated my name, but know what is going to happen. I will sanctify, not we, God will sanctify my great name, which was profaned by you among the heathen, and the heathen will know that I am that I am, says the Lord. When I will be sanctified in you before their eyes. Hang on. Ye will sanctify us before their eyes. And they will know that, this, uh, that God exists. Because this is impossible for us to live like that. Mm -hmm. You get, catch that. You see what is happening here. I will take you from among the heathen. And gather you out of all countries. And will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle water on you. And you will be clean from, just a little, all your filthiness from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart, this is new covenant talk, just by the way. A new heart will I give at you as well. And, hang on, a new spirit. Did you catch that? What is the spirit? This is the Holy Spirit that he's talking about here. Okay? The Holy Spirit causes you, I will put within you, and I will take you out of the, uh, out the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. We don't have to keep the law, we just walk in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Well, it's not holy. The Holy Spirit is walking after you. Because the Holy Spirit causes you to keep the statues. Okay? And you will dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you will be my people, and I your God. I will also save you from, this a little bit, all your uncleanness, and I will call forth the corn and will increase it and lay no famine on you. There's another accusation from the subject. Sinners cannot stop sinning. God will say, they can, if they choose to follow my spirit. Mm -hmm. So the third act, so here's another, here's an interesting 
Here is the endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and ask the faith for Jesus. Hang on. What is this language? We've been looking for them. Here they are. Here is a people that will vindicate God. In the first and final question. You know, there are many conditions that God has to wait for before He comes again. Vindicating His love, His name is one of them. This act, the third accusation is thus. A sinner will never be able to stop sinning. They are and forever will be a sinner. Without violating their freedom to choose, you cannot cause them to stop sinning. Ultimately, you will take sinners to heaven that will carry on sinning forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many Christians believe if you die tomorrow, it's fine. When you go to heaven, you just won't sin anymore. You know what that is? It's a violation of free choice because then God has to change your will to sin. The reason we sin, again, we'll get into that, but the thing is, this is the big miracle. It's exactly the opposite of what happened in Yogi Den, right? He kicked them out so that they would not eat of the tree of life, so they would not stay in their fallen state. That's forever. exactly it. Mm -hmm. So it's yes. really, uh, Did you catch that? Uh, did you catch that thing? Now, the Messiah could vindicate, I mean, uh, could vindicate accusation and accusation two at the same time. That's done. The first two accusations are clear. God is vindicated in the first two. This is fantastic. Jesus vindicating God in accusation one. Romans, what was her first accusation? Your law is unkeepable, mm -hmm. unjust. Okay? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for uh, sin, condemned sin in the flesh. To keep the law is not impossible. Therefore, the law is not unjust, and therefore God is not unjust. He hasn't sinned once. And, I didn't put up yet, He was tempted in all ways we are tempted. Because He overcame. He overcame. Okay? But there's something more interesting here. Jesus vindicated God in accusation 1. Did He condemn sin in a human nature or God nature? Flesh. Okay. Just remember that for now. We'll get to that shortly. Remember, that's the key thing about the Antichrist spirit of what he promotes. Jesus vindicating God in accusation 2. Philippians 2, 6-8. I'm not going to talk about what Satan desires and how he wants. I'm just talking about this section here. Who, being in the form of God, did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation and took him from uh, the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and was found fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. By Jesus being equal to God, dying at the cross shows that God is 100% merciful as well as 100% just. They vindicated God. How? The lawgiver paid the price. The law, remember in one of my lectures I said, the law has all the attributes of God. It is His character. Mm -hmm. So for God to say, Okay, you transgressed it, I'm going to be just by dealing out the penalty. The penalty will fall on me. The law's penalty has been met. Justice is served. And it's merciful because he took it on himself. 100% just, 100% merciful. There's a side note that I put here. To those who deny the deity of Christ. Without Christ being equal to God, He cannot be 100% merciful as well as 100% just. 
is a big hole in their argument, and that is God cannot be vindicated against the second accusation if Jesus is, if Messiah is an equal. Okay? Because then, so the adversary can just turn around and say, you see, you're actually keeping my law, the law of self, because you just sent others to die for you. You see? Yeah? Just, just, just send people, but you are actually, you, you expect the whole universe to keep the law of selflessness, but you are keeping the law of self. You're actually doing it my way. Do you see the gap in the argument that Messiah isn't equal? Okay. I've had many talks with some Hebrew roots people and they deny the deity of Christ and they could never ask me this question. They just simply say, we don't know. It's a very strong argument. <laughs> John 1, no. No, they, they reinterpret that. Okay. They actually really reinterpret that. Yes, would you remind? Reinterpret. They reinterpret all the scriptures. But when I come to logic and I just simply make this in a court setting as I do now, they can't reinterpret that. <laughs> right. yeah. But anyways, mm -hmm. unfortunately Jesus cannot vindicate God on accusation three, how many sinners can? <clears throat> Did you know? That's a good question. And then this is a little bit serious now. Did you know that God is relying on you? Let's be very clear now. Did you know his name, his title, lies in the balance? Sinners like us. Pathetic, wretched things like us. Did, did you ever consider that? You know, that's, think about that. Think about what frustrating it would have been with Israel in the desert if they just keep on sinning. His name is on the line there. Think about that. There's, there's an accusation that needs to be... This accusation has never been met before. God has never stopped intercession with sinners before. Never. There will be a time in the future when God is ready. He will sanctify. He will sanctify a group of people for that because they chose him. So you say, okay, now I give you power. And they will stop sinning. And then God will say, let's do this. And he will say, no more intercession. Let's see how uh, if Satan will win this victory. Here are the patience of the saints. Okay, here are they that keep the commandments of God. What an interesting how much trust does he have in us? And, you know, sometimes I think he has more trust in what we can do than we can, than we have in ourselves. See ourselves from his eyes. There's something very interesting going on here. But now we come to the meat of this lecture, the two Gospels. A Gospel is good news. Okay, now there are two good newses going on, basically. And these good newses are understood by a couple of questions. And there are five questions. Question number one, what is sin? Number two, why are we condemned? Number three, how did Jesus gain victory over sin? Number four, what are we from what are we saved? Number five, how are we judged? Okay, so the gospel basically concludes, oh, sorry, basically concludes with the last, last one. So, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what everybody knows it is. But nobody knows really what it entails. So, it's very, it becomes very ambiguous. The fact is, we preach a Gospel. The Catholic Church preach a Gospel. Many apostate Protestants preach a Gospel. People spraying each other with doom in the faces preach a Gospel. <laughs> Listen, it's even a church in, uh, I think it's Virginia, that says we can go to church naked. Mm -hmm. They preach the gospel. 
Uh, sorry, going off topic, but I, 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 I can't imagine a preacher standing naked, you know, and the little girls and the boys says, yeah, that's okay. But he preaches the gospel, and they will all say it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to stop asking questions. And these are the five questions that you can dissect the truth from the false. I'm going to give the first gospel. And this is the anti-Messiah gospel. And I will ask the five questions and you will see what is going on there. So the first gospel is original sin. There I have a picture of them, Adam and Eve eating an apple. And the basic idea is original sin is the sin that was transgressed in the garden and it just flows down throughout humanity. The adversary does sometimes try to take original sin and rename it to righteousness by faith, but it really falls flat. <laughs> and you will see it later why. So if you call a spade a spade, it becomes very hard. If you start asking these questions, you can't deceive it. First question what is sin? Original sin says, we cannot help but sin every moment. Therefore, our natures, inherited from Adam, is what sin is. You are sin. You are born sinners. Why are we condemned? We are condemned for having an unfallen or sinful fleshly nature. That's why we're condemned. So we're born condemned. This is also predicated on a Calvinistic predestination. You're predestined to die. Okay? How did Jesus gain victory over sin? By taking an unfallen, sinless, unfleshly nature, he died in our stead. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. So, from what are we saved? From death, justification. Not from sinning, as we still have an unfallen nature. Oh, oh, in fallen nature. In other words, we are justified but not sanctified, and that's the key difference between these two gospels. We'll see it now. How are we judged? We are judged according to our belief in Jesus dying on, for us on the cross. If yes, you enter into heaven. If no, you will not enter into heaven. And that's basically it. Justification, sanctification is a nice to have. <coughs> catch that. Okay. Let's just take an example. Let's take disobedience to parents as an example. So let's say a boy is always disobedient to parent. What is sin? The boy's nature. The boy being human, not his disobedience. Him being disobedient is just a, a cause, not a, 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 a effect. Why is the boy condemned? Well, he was born as a human. How did Jesus gain victory over sin? Jesus was God, so he died in the boy's stead. From what are we saved? Death, justification. So the boy will go to heaven. No, he will not stop disobeying his parents. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. Him stopping to disobey his parents is just fruit. It's just a nice to have. Okay? How are we judged? We are judged according to belief. So the boy can carry on disobeying his parents as long as he believes. Did you catch this gospel? Next. Original sin. How did Jesus gain victory over sin? By taking on unfallen, sinless, unfleshly nature, he died in our stead. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that means sarks, fallen sinful nature, is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, of which you heard that it would come and even now is in the world. Sarks, it means flesh, it's basically human nature. It is uh, a human being, or, you know, the carnal. The spirit denies Messiah coming into being like us. The reason why it says Jesus could not sin, well, he didn't take our nature. It's a flaw in that argument. 
if he didn't take our nature, then he wasn't tempted really as we are, in every way. And what about that accusation? Remember that accusation? God's law is impossible to be kept. If God wasn't fully human as what we are, then that accusation cannot be, cannot be met. Because He is then keeping up, not His creation. You see how it changes. Okay. Righteousness by faith. Now, oh, oh, by the way, I said before, I like this, this gospel. My flesh likes it. It's easy. It's easy. But I like this one more. No, no, it's not hard, actually. Um, the, the thing about this one, why I like it more, it's more love. It actually makes me free. This is the gospel I think. So let's go ask the same questions. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4, Romans 3, 20, 7, 7. Why are we condemned? We are condemned for choosing to follow our fallen or sinful flesh and natures inherited from Adam and sin. Okay? So, this gospel is predicated on free choice. We are condemned for choosing to follow our flesh. Okay? You'll find that in Romans 8. 1. How did Jesus gain victory over sin? By taking fallen sinful nature inherited from Adam, but walking after the Spirit, thus condemning sin in the flesh. He was just like one of us. But he walked after the Spirit 100% of the time. That's why he never sinned. And that's how he vindicated God. From what are we saved? From death, justification, and a way is made possible to stop sinning, sanctification. Perfection is a promise. You can, oh, sorry. You can find that in 2 Peter 1 4. Basically, having these promises. That's what Peter starts with that sentence. Now, let's carry on. How are we judged? By simply believing? No. We are judged according to the light. Remember in the past lecture I said, what is light? I am Jesus, the word, the law and commandments we have received. Okay. <laughs> Two people doing exactly the same thing. One is ignorant, one is not. That passage would say, God wings at the time of ignorance. We are judged according to the light we have received. Did you walk according to the light you have received? More light, more responsibility. So let's ask that same question about the boy having the being disobedient to the parents. This is going to be a bit more different outcome. What is sin? Disobedient, being disobedient to the parents, not the boy. There's nothing wrong with him. He's just choosing to follow his flesh, which is, leads to the following. Why is he condemned? Because he chose to follow his flesh and disobey his parents. How did Jesus gain victory? Jesus was an example to the boy on how to follow the Spirit. And, uh, uh, and he condemned disobedience to parents by being in the flesh. That means... From what are we saved? He made from death, so the boy will not face death. But a way is possible made for the boy to stop being disobedient to the parents of what Jesus did here. Did you catch that? A way is possible. God is not going to force you to follow Him. But He makes a way. You have to choose it. He actually, what basically Jesus did here in this gospel, He gave you a choice. He made it possible so that you can choose. From what, uh, 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 so perfection is possible. It is possible for the boy to stop to being disobedient to his parents. It's possible. It's a promise. And I, I see a lot of people, they would say to, say, oh, it's just laws and regulations. I see them all as promises. Coming to God, you will no longer be disobedient to your parents. It's a promise. Honor thy father and thy mother. I see it as a promise. How are we judged? We are judged according to the light we received. We have, uh, um, so, how would that boy be judged? According to what laws is given. No, 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 it's more than that. If the boy 
understood what God is, and you understood you will no longer disobey his parents, God will simply say, did you walk in the light that you have received? Mm -hmm. But no, here's something interesting. And this is where the other gospel falls short. What if you're not a Christian? Mm -hmm. You have never ne known Jesus. You don't even know what this is about. But you honored your parents. You, you, you know this is true. So you did follow the light that you have. According to the previous gospel, you ain't getting to heaven. According to this one, chances are many will come from the east and the west and will sit with Abraham, but the children of the kingdom will not. Why? They had great light, they didn't walk after it. Do you understand that this gospel is trying to save us from death and from sin, where the other one is just trying to save us from death? The other one is just a trying to excuse. Yes? So then, like example, Boy, his parents that didn't have the gospel. It's keeping God's natural law anyway. No. So, how, so how does that work with salvation? So, what happens here is the boy doesn't, uh, let's say the, boy, the, the person doesn't know anything about this gospel or anything. He's just grown up as an atheist in some unknown country. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit still works within that boy. And he still would show, and he will still strive with him to show, listen, honor your parents. You know, to do this, do this. And he will try to give him light. Now, if the boy or the person decides, I will not follow that light, he will be judged accordingly. What if you meet Jesus? Let's give this example. Let's say the person just now gets Jesus. He understands, oh, this is what this is all about. If he truly loves the light, he will walk towards it. God just simply winks at the time of ignorance. So what about a person that says, I keep Torah, but no, nah, I don't like that God so much. Like, he honors his parents, but he doesn't. You know what, I, I call it nonsense. Because God mm -hmm. is the Lord. The law is his character. To fall in love with the one, you will fall in love with the other. Mm -hmm. okay. Exposure. Like all the other spirits, we need to expose this one. When dealing with them, you will find that it is about faith, grace, and love, and God, and all the sweet, lovely stuff. This spirit is just dripping with love. Mm -hmm. Oh, he loves. It's just love. Grace. Oh, grace. Hallelujah. Praise, worship, we love, love, and it's faith, all oh, have belief in God. Yet you can't stop feeling the indifference to the law of God and the promotion for moral relativism. What does that mean? I say what is right and wrong. It's love God, love God, but I say what is right and wrong. Hmm. This spirit deviously redefined terms such as faith, sin, law, Love so that you so that if you disagree with him, you are by definition associated as faithless, legalistic, and hateful. Catch that trick. Did you catch that? If I say I'm all about love, God, love your neighbor, and you come to me and say, No, we need to honor our parents, you're not about love, you're legalistic. Catch the, the, the language here. So let's go into how it does it. Let's talk about how it describes faith. The Spirit will often say, We are saved by faith through grace, not by works. While it is true, it is true, we are saved by faith, but not by works, in its fullest sense. But they don't take it in its fullest sense. We, in its fullest sense, we are justified. Here, you need to ask the question if they mean true faith or hypocrisy. See, he twists the word hypocrisy to mean faith. A person claiming to have faith, yet his, this faith doesn't reflect in his or her life, is simply a lying hypocrite. Consequently, the justification by faith 
being promoted here is really justification by hypocrisy. Remember that argument a little while ago that I said, the argument that I said, hey, one, if sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4, Romans 3, 20, more specifically the law of Moses, or the law of God, Romans 7, 7, and whatever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23, therefore faith establishes the law, Romans uh, 3, 31. Consequently, this means the following. A faithful believer will keep the law, and a faithful believer will not, to illustrate this in a simple term. A faithful wife does not commit adultery. An unfaithful wife does. A hypocritical wife says she has faith, but and says she is faithful, but commits adultery. Do you catch that? This antichrist spirit takes faith and it renames it. Uh, renames hypocrisy to faith. In other words, it's presumption for it. Uh, it's simply presumption. Presumption is a counterfeit of faith. Presumption takes hold of the promises of God and uses them to excuse transgression. We are saved, that's why. You see? Thus, faith then becomes a substitute for obedience. We don't have to keep the law, we just need to have faith. True faith, however, also takes hold on God's promises, but on condition of obedience. It is, it is, actually, it is just simply that. A faithful son will honor his parents. An unfaithful son will not. But this spirit takes it and twists it, so that when you disagree, you're legalistic and unfaithful. Catch that. It is very important that you need to understand these the, these terms and definitions of the spirit so that you can tackle it accordingly. Yes. Um, now we've got a there's there's another um, it's an issue where they will take New Testament what they would term as law and New Testament and they'll make it a binding. I'll, I'll get to that now. I actually have it on my next next one. So that is called they call it the law of Christ. <laughs> this one is perhaps interesting. The Spirit will constantly say that the law it keeps is the law of Christ and will put forth this dichotomy between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. The argument is that the law of Christ is to love God, love your neighbor, and that the law of Moses is a ministry of condemnation. And it will quote Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Consequently, love becomes. No. Love becomes a substitute for indifference to good and evil as the law of Moses instructs what good and evil is. You can read that for yourself. It basically says, see I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. In that you keep the commandments of God, love Him, walk in His ways, keep His statutes, do His judgments, so that you may live. That's the, basically in a nutshell, that is the law of Moses. It's basically... Like when said today, the spokesman of God. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that because I always think people like, okay, but how do you know to love? Who taught but you that's that love is? What does love mean? No, how no. do you love Let me get to that. Let me get to that. No, no, it's very accurate. It is moral relativism. Remember the first no. gospel is about moral yeah. relativism. The only way out here is that either the Moses was lying. Or God gave the wrong instructions because good and evil. Does right becomes good? How about murder? Does that ever become good? Will it ever become good? Will, will, how about, you know, will honoring your parents ever become evil? Probably. So where are we going? It's talking there. Son, you need to kill him. I will honor you. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> or, this law of Christ is redefined. I believe it is redefined. The true name for this law is really called the law of the lemma. 
as the occultist Alistair Crowley calls it, and it's inspect what he says. Mm -hmm. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under all. In other words, your question, how do they know? Well, if I say it is under it is in accordance with love, it is okay. Mm -hmm. It is okay for me to have sexual relations outside of wedlock with my mother because I love her. Love. It's a substitute. Yes. Love. 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 Did you catch that? Love. It's all about love. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do what you want. As long as it's based in love. As long as you think it is based in love. Though. You see the difference here? The one says, love God and love your neighbor because all the law and the prophets hangs on these two laws. In other, other words, you will not disobey your parents, or uh, dishonor your parents, because you love them. First four commandments, or first words, the first four words, love God. Last six words, love your neighbor. In fact, they would always propagate that this is a new law. Now who? Deuteronomy, um, I think it's six. Simply says, love God with all your heart, all your soul. Mm -hmm. That is which which Messiah quote. Mm -hmm. And what about your neighbor? Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? One is taking love and uses it as justification for why you can have moral relativism, while the other one is using love and saying, that is why I keep the law of God. Okay. But then you have a, I'm talking about a Christian who really thinks they're a Christian. Is like, love your neighbor. It's all about love. So, so but then again, where did you learn to so love? So let's talk about that. Let's <laughs> talk about that. Let's talk about that. So many, many people. Yes, 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 a good point. Many people um, that claim to be Christian would say, you just need to love God and love your neighbor. I would then zoom in. Like I would with an atheist. Sounds harsh. This is how I do it. I want to establish moral, a moral waypoint. That's what I discussed. Remember that discussion that I had talked about waypoints? You need to in go into waypoints. If you don't establish a waypoint, you don't know. So the first thing I ask is, how do you know something is right or wrong? If the person would go and say, I feel, then I would say, but I feel differently. Mm -hmm. Let's establish a waypoint of how to define right and wrong. That's the first thing. I will get into that in my next lecture on how to get into these arguments. And the other term for this is postmodernism. Mm -hmm. okay? It simply means I choose what is right and wrong. I, me. Now, I'm just labeling a couple of terms. There's another term that they use is called New Covenant. An old covenant. And it's basically a modern form of Marcionism. It's a type of Gnosticism. So what it means is um, they would some, sometimes put these two as a dichotomy between each other. So they would say the God of the Old Testament was a tyrannical troubled deity of the Jews whose laws only represented rhetorical damage and sin and punishment. It's bad, 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 bad. But the God of the New Testament is altogether a better God, having just love and grace and peace and have all mankind. Yeah. That's basically Markant. Okay? Now it sounds bad, but that's how they depict the Old Testament. I haven't had people come to me and say, yeah, uh, Old Testament says you can just stone. You know, you don't know what it says. People don't study the scriptures. So Marcionism is easy to latch on, and the fact that Christian churches mostly preach out of New Testament writings without the understanding of the Old Testament writings, it's easy. It's easy to make these little stupid links. Sorry, just quickly going back to the first um, gospel, that we walk with the Holy Spirit, eh? that's the first one. I don't know, because obviously that's what Christians, current Christians believe. We all walk in the Holy Spirit. 
So then my question is, which I find is difficult to explain to them, is that if I'm walking, I'm a Christian, I believe in Yeshua, so I'm, he's given me his Holy Spirit and I'm walking like that. So why has the Holy Spirit not condemned me to follow Torah? It's because the different, uh, uh, it's the terminology that has been shifted. Mm -hmm. Let me explain to my next one. Sin. Mm -hmm. Sin to the Spirit is not the transgression of the law of life, but rather doing something wrong according to self. So you're setting your own standards all the time. Absolutely. That is what sin is important to. You will find that they will quote Romans 14, but never together with 1, 3, 4. Sin, uh, whatever is not a faith is sin. Sometimes you quote this, and they say, yes, the law of Christ is over going in circles. So to your question, they would justify their moral relativism as walking by the Spirit and not according to the letter. So she asks, why would the Spirit let, let me want to keep Shabbat as an example, but not for you? Well, the Spirit works differently for everyone. See the moral relativism that comes in. Okay? Now, I want to draw... Sorry, mm -hmm. So, what you're saying is that when there's the Spirit exists, and it does, um, Oh, the Spirit hasn't convicted me, so we're a bit different now, it's convicted you or something. Yeah. But in the end it comes back to, but you don't know Torah, perhaps. The that is why He hasn't been able to convict you anyway, because you just don't know the Word of God. Sometimes, sometimes you don't need to. Okay. I mean, Torah wasn't written until way later. <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure that the Spirit has been working. Mm -hmm. It's been always working. Mm -hmm. I have many people that come to me, I know I'm skipping, but taking some of next week's lectures, but many people say, yeah, but the scriptures was never given before Exodus. Right. Really? Leviticus, Leviticus 18 explicitly states that the reason why the land spewed them out was because they transgressing the laws that God is now giving to Israel. Okay? The Spirit is working. Now, there is, the Spirit is, there's some truth to it, the Spirit does work differently with you than it with me. Mm -hmm. But at the end, it's going to the same goal. It thing. will not lead you away exactly. from truth. So it will not lead you away from Sabbath. In this case, it thinks it leads you away. Moral relativism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, do you think that a lot of um, the conflict that we have with our brethren is because we're being taught differently? And that's why I think, I know that In my first lecture, I made a very interesting statement and talked about knowledge and truth. And that's exactly that. So in my first lecture, I go and say, you will know the truth if you sincerely seek after it. In other words, what I'm telling you, God will take care of you, don't worry. He will give to you truth. It's about you not wanting to know it. Okay. So I want to draw something about this thing in, in regards to these two Gospels. I'm going to draw the first gospel and how it defines sin. Okay? So I'm going to write it down. <coughs> so it says sin there. And uh, whatever you're doing, it is sin is evil. And, be and because you are doing evil, you receive guilt. And this leads to. How are we saved? Jesus. Okay. Just be believe. Believe that He died for you on the cross. Okay. And you're saved. 
doesn't say anything about law. What sin is this speaking of? What I, what I say. Okay? In fact, I ask many people, chances are you will get a yes. Do you think you're a good person? Yeah. Why? Because the definition of sin. Okay? That's the first gospel definition of how, how it works. Let's get to the second gospel and it will be a little bit uh, more intriguing. But before I do that, I want to ask a question. How many of you like have seen, uh, understand a cat and how it works in the chasing mice or things? Mm. You know? Inside a house, a cat is very lovely, cuddly, whatnot. Open the doors and he goes chase a mouse and he plays the poor thing to death. Mm. Is that an evil thing? <laughs> <laughs> But yes, a, yes, another question with that. Do you, do you take him to do you cut his head off? Do you kill him because he was doing something evil and does he know that he that he did something evil? Okay, that's another question. A person had a gun in his hand. And they shot, and he shot another person willingly. Okay, now hang on. Does it matter if the person shooting was two years old versus the person shooting that was 24? Could be the kid just picked up the gun and played with it. But what if he was 24? Do you ask the same questions? This gospel show. That sin is he both evil and guilt. No. It is evil, but it brings guilt. Let's go get into that. So we have sin here. Is okay. this still the first gospel? No, no, we're going to the second this gospel now. So we got sin here. So sin is actually two things. So it is evil. Okay. And it leads to guilt. Okay. Uh, yeah. So a person that doesn't know the gospel or anything and he murders someone, he will have guilt. It leads to guilt. And he will understand that what he did was evil. So yes, sin. Is, the first gospel says sin is both evil and guilt. No. Sin is evil and it leads to guilt. So we say it is, it leads. But there's another relationship. Oh, another thing here. Uh, and this is basically, it's actually two, two ways. So, in the one way, he is justifying it, and the other way is repenting. Okay, let me explain that a little bit in more detail. I just gossiped about someone, I said some very vile things. Evil. What I did was evil. But he deserved it. Leads to guilt. Okay? I'm guilt. I'm not talking about that guilt where you think, oh, what I did was bad. No, I'm not talking about that guilt. I'm talking about I'm guilty. You're guilty. Okay? Yes, I'm, I'm guilty here, but I'm talking more about it's fine. I accept that guilt. Okay? So I gossiped about something. I did something that was evil. I'm therefore guilty. Okay? But what if, uh, and it leads to guilt, but what if I did say, fine, he deserved it, but then I go and say, no, actually he didn't. What do I do immediately? I repent, but it doesn't take the fact away that, that I did it, it still remains evil. Okay? So 
So here's something interesting. So, guilt leads to hell. What we did was evil. But that, because we repent, it gets excused through Jesus, our Messiah, and it basically leads to salvation. The salvation. Okay? Now note something interesting here. In order for you to get to here, you need to repent so that you can be saved. The first gospel has no repentance. It makes repentance. Uh, my graph is not the best, but I'm trying to <laughs> best illustrate what I can. How many times more must I confess this sin? Okay, so if you have sin, if you have sin, and you confess it. Turn from it. Exactly. Now it can be. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about relapses. Yes, you will have relapses. But always go and repent. But in us, we in our society are always looking for the cure. There's another thing called preventive. Sometimes pray for God to help you through this. And if you don't have enough faith, there's another prayer. Oh Lord, help my unbelief. Yes. Okay? Back to this thing. What sin are we talking about here? Transgression of God's law. Uh, I'm not going to write it down. But basically, transgression of God's law. So, if you look in the first one, um, if I'm talking about some of you, and now I'm guilty of transgressing. Is it then that thing that they say, oh, but because of the grace of Yeshua covers me now, I don't need to go and ask him for forgiveness. He just forgives me past, present, and future. Exactly. Do you see that it undermines repentance? Yes. Now let's talk about the, your judge according to your life that received. The law says, you remember the seventh day to keep the holy, And we go to a country where people don't know about God or anything. Are they guilty? No. What they did was evil. Yes. Yeah. But they have no guilt. Same like the toddler of two years old shooting the person. It has no guilt. You are judged according to the light received. So if the person has no guilt, he is excused because God brings it to time for ignorance. You see the difference in these two Gospels. Can I just ask something? Mm. Um, in country law, like here, if you break the law, you're guilty, and then you lose In our laws, even, even then, yes, it is true, but we're dealing with the earth, earth media, but many times they do take in consideration if you were knowledgeable of it. Okay? So, for example, um, if a person, I mean, it's quite obvious, a person that murders someone knows that what he's done was breaking the law. Mm -hmm. But in that example of the toddler, the country is not going to go and say, well, you need to go to jail. But some countries don't have unjust justice, so they sometimes will take the kid to jail. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's almost as if, it's almost as if, you know, when, um, when Paul talks about it, he says, you know, without Torah, you never knew what sin was. Mm -hmm. So the more you can into it, you can equate it to the things, the way you, what you thought, oh, let me go back. But I'm saying, you know, if you ask any person, he'll say, you know, you think you're an okay guy. Mm -hmm. You've done okay. And you're doing right by God. And then he shows you this book. And then you start to read that you're not so much okay. That you're not so clean up. And you're not so, to go into that space now of knowing what you know and going back, you'll be adding into that guilt. That, that is, that is accurate. Yes. But as you grow, you don't want to you don't want to hurt God anymore. You don't want to hurt yourself. You actually want to be obedient when it comes to that whole life cycle again. But you actually start to realize what is what is right and what is wrong. And you start to choose it. But in the in the case of I think with the skill it's like you correct me if I'm wrong, brother, but knowing what you're doing and choosing to go against it, you know, speaks to me of like what Moses had to face at the at the bottom of the mountain. Yes. Now, can you see the grievous crime? Yes. I think that's what it's actually used in. It says that if you 
enters the most holy, he is atoning, he is intercessing. It is a time when he stops. It's a time when he will stop. Okay? I'm just going to go into there. There will be a people. I don't know when. Hope it's this generation. <laughs> I don't know when. That will stop sinning. God will allow Satan to, like he did with Job, test the hell out of them. And they will not sin once. Now imagine, imagine that responsibility on their shoulders. Yeah. Now what will happen out of that test? Sin will not enter again. These guys will be, um, they will be like, they would like be the, the witnesses to the whole host of the universe of what sin was like and how God is right. Sin will never enter again. I, I don't know what passage that is, but it will never appear a second time. Never rear its head a second time. Sin is an intruder okay, in this universe. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into too much more about that, but basically, so. The, this gospel's understanding of what sin is, as how to deal with it, is much different than the other normal, nominal Christians yeah. dealing with it. Okay. So, effective countermeasures. So, I have this plane, a rocket is being fired, and this plane is going. Okay. If I can sum out, so I'll oh, sum out, sum up the effective countermeasures in one sentence, it would be to out love it. Remember, the Spirit is going to say, love, 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 grace, grace, grace. And if you disagree with Him, you have no love. You're legalistic, not having faith. You deny Christ at the cross, etc., etc. The flaw in His position, the Spirit now, is that the Messiah you believe in loves the sinner more than the Messiah it is promoting. I'll get to that now. Let me <coughs> demonstrate using this addict analogy. Anyone that helps the addict to simply stay out of jail, instead of helping him up to overcome his addiction, doesn't love the addict. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in the same way, if Messiah only helps the sinner to stay out of hell doesn't, and not to overcome his sin, he then doesn't love the sinner. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? Yes. This gospel is nicer than the other one, because this Messiah loves you more. You're in overcoming in essence, your Jesus, your, no, there's two, Messiah, anti-Messiah, real Messiah, loves you so much more than because he saves you, not only from death, but from sin as well. This question exposes, here's a question that you can ask, this question exposes the spirit clearly. Suppose there is no reward of heaven, no promises, no nothing. Would you still do that which is right according to God? And if yes, why? Mm -hmm. I haven't received the one good answer. Uh, the only answer I just received. Yeah, but that isn't the case. Hmm. Asking this question is confusing to the selfish soul. It's first spirit is the law of it's Satan. And it's the law of self. Do what thou wilt. He will only follow God if he can get something out of it. But to the person who is selfless, to him, it is all about vindicating God's justice. His answer will be, yes. Job 13.15 Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. This is basically, there's two laws at war in today's lecture. The law of self versus the law of selflessness. The anti-Messiah advocates a law of selflessness and promotes it as love, grace, happiness, fluffiness. Mm -hmm. Whereas the law of self, a selflessness, it promotes as bondage. These two. That's why they say the law of God or the law of Moses is bondage. You see, do not get. Uh, uh, you have been at liberty with Christ. Do not get entangled with the law uh, with bondage in Galatians. Well, you can 
interpret it either way. But from the law of the lemma, which they call the law of Christ's side, of course the law of Moses is going to be bondage, a restriction of liberty. Of course. Now when I deal with Christians and they say, we just need to love God, love our neighbor. I said, yeah, I definitely agree. That's why I keep saying it. Mm. <laughs> you catch that. <laughs> Your views needs to change. Now, there's another thing that I want to ask that I haven't written yet. Um, many people ask the question, am I saved? Ooh, he's the place. Okay. Many people ask that question, I don't. It's a good question, but I think your mind is on the wrong spot. How about this? Is what I, I've, asked, I've said this in a previous lecture, is what I'm doing vindicating God or vindicating the adversary? Yes. Salvation to me is just a bonus. Yes. What happens to me doesn't matter. I will right. trust Him. Okay? I've made this example, I'll do this again, suppose someone hit you in the face, by me fighting back am I saved? Wrong question. By me fighting back am I vindicating mm -hmm. God or vindicating the adversary? Mm -hmm. You understand the way that the selfless soul differs from the selfish soul? Mm -hmm. okay. So, am I saved? Good question. Do you vindicate God in what you do? That's where you, where, how you should respond. Why should God care about you if you vindicate the adversary? Why? He, can, he is sad, but you choose that he should not care. That actually reminds me of that whole uh, time when uh, that uh, Pharisee came to Yeshua and said, How can a man, uh, how can a man be saved? And he said to him, um, Have you. I know your parents that you yes. decided to go through different uh, scriptures. Uh, scriptures, yeah, and about, about keeping the Torah. Mm -hmm. And this man said to him, uh, all of these things I've done from my youth. So, <coughs> I mean, just, it just shows, shows, shows it from that perspective. It doesn't end there. <coughs> you know, there's another law that he wasn't keeping. Yeah, yeah. That's, That's true. true. But, but notice the emphasis. I see it, I read it a little bit deeper than many do. There's another law that he wasn't keeping in. Was the first commandment. Mm -hmm. I should have none of the copy for me. That's right. Okay? His riches was his God. Mm -hmm. Okay? But there's something more into this. Whose law was he keeping? The law of self or the law of selflessness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was keeping the law of self. He wasn't vindicating God. Yes, you can honor your parents and da 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 da. But he knowingly rejected the light. Yes. Killed. Yes. Okay. The next uh, lecture will be actual rebuttals. So we have had three lectures. We've talked about knowledge and truth. We've went into how to build arguments and what are logical fallacies. Second lecture we went into spirits and how to address them. This lecture we went into what the war is about at the anti-Messiah spirit. And most of the people will be influenced by that spirit in some way or some, some form. So you know how to outlove them. Many people would say, um, Jesus loved you more than sin and whatnot and whatnot. My Jesus loves me so much that I don't that he will try to help me to stop sinning. Mm -hmm. Your Jesus loves you more. That already gives you victory. Okay? So we're going to go into rebuttals. So I just list a couple of here, but I'm going to go into some of the more tedious mm -hmm. ones. You're saved by faith alone. Mm -hmm. Really? So we don't need to take up our cross and walk after you. We just need to have faith. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. You're no longer under the law. Really? So I can punch my mother in the face? No, no, no. Oh, so I'm still under that law. <laughs> you know, I find it always so funny. We're actually just trying to get rid of the Sabbath, though. Yeah, yeah that's all. Yeah. 
So they go for this. But when you bring on the other law, then suddenly, no, 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 they, 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 yeah. juggling. You know? yeah. By keeping the law, you make Christ's grace or none effect. Really? So, if I want to have Christ's grace, I should sin. The law was only for the Jews. Interesting. I wonder why God chased out the Canaanites. You only need to, uh, the law was nailed to the cross. Up oh, yours, mother. The law was nailed to the cross. <laughs> my dad would give me a slap across my face and I know my, my face will be out there while I'm still standing there. Don't worry, I'll edit that one now. <laughs> you only need to love God and love your neighbor. There's that thing. I will get into that. Um, the law wasn't given before it's this. Etc. Etc. There are many arguments. The moral law is fine because that's what we keep to. The moral law. So, so yeah, yeah. that's all yes, the moral law. Yes, we yes, keep to that. Yes, that's the problem. You know, when, when talking, this is my view in regards to instructions. And this is my instructions. Uh, th this is my view. God's instructions. Period. But Christians divide it into civil, ceremonial, whatnot. Okay. And, but you need to understand what do they mean by their terminology. And I understand what they mean by the terminology. You need to define it for them. So you need to employ their terms so that you can put them back. For example, they go on. So ask them, what is the ceremonial law? No, it's all about the sacrifices and what they're right. I understand it. It's basically the sacrificial system. Okay? And then what is the moral law? No, it's about this and this and this. They're right. Let give it to them. So now this is what I do. I say, can, did Jesus fulfill the law? Yes, yes, yes. So, did Jesus fulfill, honor your parents and I no longer have to uh, give sacrifices? Yes, yes, yes. Wait. Do you catch what I just did? Mm -hmm. It is true, their understanding of moral law versus mm -hmm. ceremonial law. Makes it okay. easy for but here's the thing. You have a sacrifice. You are keeping that law. You have a high priest. That law is being kept. Mm -hmm. 